Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Asim Paranspe. I am a faculty here at Ayuka, and I'm one of the coordinators of this summer school in addition to professors uh, Nishant Singh and Surhud More, also from Ayuka. So it's uh, really great to see a huge number of you. There are already 223, 224 people here, uh, and a lot more people are expected to join over YouTube. So this is really the first time that we are organizing an online summer school, as you know, because of the situation around us. We live in a brave new world now. Uh, we have decided to bring all our lectures, our annual summer school lectures and refresher course lectures to you online. Uh, I just have a few announcements before I hand over to our first speaker. Uh, since this is the first time we are doing this online, we would like to maintain some basic rules about how to engage in such lectures. So can I request all participants to please always keep yourself muted in both audio as well as video. Okay, so when you log in, you will automatically be muted in audio, but your video is probably in your control. So I can see several videos on. Uh, I would request you all to also mute your videos. So to do this, if you have never used Zoom before, you should be able to control your audio and video settings in the bottom left corner of the Zoom window. It should say start video, stop video, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so please mute your videos. Uh, the schedule for all the lectures is online. You would have received emails with uh, the URL for the schedule. This is a live schedule. What that means is that the schedule is a Google document which can, which will continuously be updated. So we will not announce if a particular lecture has been modified, if the speaker has swapped with somebody, etc. So I would suggest once every day in the morning, you should just go to the, the link of the schedule and refresh the page. It will show you the most updated schedule. Okay. And we will generally not make announcements unless there's a big change like a holiday or something, uh, which we don't expect to happen. But uh, minor changes in the schedule will just keep coming up online. All right. We are also streaming the, all these lectures live on YouTube. So we realize that uh, there will be network connectivity issues. Zoom can take up a lot of bandwidth and you may not have uh, the sufficient bandwidth to connect properly all the time. So in case you have problems with connecting over Zoom, you can always go to the YouTube channel. The link was also provided in the email that you received. And you there is like a 20 second delay or so. But apart from that, the, the streaming is live. And we have tested it and it seems to work fine. So please also take a look there. All right. The last thing I want to say is about uh, interaction with the speakers. This is again the first time that we are doing this and uh, there will be some teething issues, but I just want to present the plan that we have for the next couple of days. We may change this as we go along. So what we will, what we are proposing is the following. Right now, all your chat windows are disabled. Okay. So again, if you have not used Zoom before, if you look in the bottom menu, there is a, there is a button called chat. So if you click on that right now, you will not be able to chat with anybody, but about 25 to 30 minutes into the talk, today's first talk and also the talks in the first couple of days, we will enable this chat window and you will be able to type, type things here. So we will ask you to refrain from, uh, you know, saying hello to your friends, etc., and only reserve the chat window for asking questions to the speaker. So what we will do is uh, around 25 to 30 minutes in, we will enable the chat window. You can type your questions. And if you have typed a question, then at the end of the talk, we will open the discussion floor for taking questions and you can raise your hand. So this is a very nice feature of Zoom. Uh, what you will see uh, in again in the, in the bottom right, uh, menu bar is a uh, option to raise hand okay and when you click on that option uh, there will be a little blue hand next to your uh, next to your icon and your name will come up to the it will float up to the top of the list and we'll be able to see it and towards the end so if you have a question you please type your question into the chat 
and raise your hand at the end of the talk. Okay, you can type your question as soon as the chat window is enabled, but you raise your hand only at the end of the talk. We will tell you when you can raise your hands and we will unmute you one by one and you can interact with the speaker. In addition to this, we also have an option for typing questions on YouTube. Okay, so if you go to the YouTube link, there is a chat window there as well. And you can type your questions there. There is someone monitoring that window and there may be some questions taken from there as well. Okay, so that is all that I had to tell you. Uh, I'm very pleased to have the director of Ayuka, Professor Shomak Raichaudhuri as our first uh, speaker. Uh, and he will he will take over from now. So Shomak, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Asim. Thank you. And uh, thank you everybody. Good morning uh, for um, attending. Um, Today's uh, talk, I'm hoping that you will stay with us till the very end. Um, uh, we are now going to have two or three lectures per day, um, the weekdays for the next four weeks. And, um, and, and so please stay with us. And today uh, we, of course, uh, have a smaller lecture than uh, in today, uh, in the first lecture than, than normal because of all the introduction, et cetera. And I thought I'd start with a, a general introduction um, to astronomy, astrophysics, because many of you might not have had an astrophysics course before. It is not something that is uh, usually um, included in uh, university uh, syllabi. Uh, you might be fortunate enough to be at a university where astrophysics is taught. Um, now, before that, and, and this is why I raised this issue, I'm going to give you a little introduction to uh, where we are now, where I am now. I am sitting in my office in, uh, in Ayuka the Inter-University Center for Astronomy, Astrophysics in Pune. And uh, uh, we uh, were essentially set up, just a minute, yeah. We were set up in um, uh, more than 30 years ago as a center um, by the U University Grants Commission, UGC, um, which is under the Ministry of Human Resources, um, to help um, the teaching and research in astronomy and astrophysics all over India. Because even in the 1980s, uh, it was felt that only two or three universities among the 700 universities in India at that time actually taught astrophysics, whereas worldwide it was already entering the curricula of, um, of universities as a separate subject. Uh, it is still not a separate subject anywhere in, in India, uh, other than uh, um, maybe one or two institutions where it is taught as astronomy and space sciences. Uh, and, um, but uh, Ayuka uh, did two things. One was uh, Professor Narlikar, who is seen there, um, you know, um, actually using the first spade to, to inaugurate the building of Ayuka, um, um, helped to nucleate research in astronomy and astrophysics in India. At that point, there was no central place where um, such research could be done, and the government decided that instead of giving uh, individual universities resources to do astronomy, it would be smart to actually set up a central institute. And here in this lovely campus uh, built by Charles Korea, uh, we um, are now situated. And, um, and, and so anybody who is any, at any uh, Indian university, private uh, or uh, public, or, uh, they can come if they want to do um, astronomy, astrophysics, if you are a, a teacher or a professor um, at any of these colleges or universities and you want to do research in astronomy, you and your students can come uh, and visit us. We have a scheme uh, where uh, frequent visitors uh, get associateship. So you can become an associate of Ayuka and, um, and we uh, will um, uh, make sure that uh, you know, um, the, the government, the UGC pays for your coming here and staying here um, and, uh, and we would support you here. Um, in addition to that, our job is to um, set up teaching in astronomy, astrophysics all over uh, India in universities and now uh, com coming a long way in the 30 years, uh, um, many, many universities now have astronomy, astrophysics courses, part of mathematics or physics, uh, BSc and MSc, um, there are courses that are uh, special papers in, in subjects, that are uh, courses that are standalone courses, etc. And, and we've been doing that. So very recently, we've been um, asked to become teaching learning center in astronomy, astrophysics in India, and also the National Resource Center to do online courses. 
uh, if you look on Swayam, which is the uh, government's uh, MOOC channel, um, we are setting up astronomy astrophysics courses there. There have been two such done in the last two years. And, um, and, and now uh, this experiment of um, actually doing uh, uh, summer school online. Uh, so um, we have um, the university associates who actually commit to be in Ayuka for uh, several weeks uh, uh, a year. It started from about the first batch of 20, and now we have about uh, um, 179 current university associates, and you can become one if you're a university teacher. And if you, you are a student, then um, you um, can, uh, of course, I'm being muted for some reason. Okay. And uh, as you can see, that our um, uh, our uh, university associates um, are with us or with, um, with themselves. And I'm happy to say that all those red dots that you see in there um, are uh, places where uh, university associates come from. Um, they come to us and here they meet other people from other parts of India. They set up uh, research programs. And now they're also working with people who come from abroad, who also visit us um, and, and, and then uh, use facilities all over the world. And we'll talk about some of these as we go along in this course that um, they, they use all, uh, we, we teach people, we show people how to use facilities in space as well as um, uh, in, uh, with telescopes all over the world. And a lot of these, uh, this research is happening right now in Ayuka and also in all the universities with the help of Ayuka. So uh, as you know, close to 300 papers were written in the last year by our associates, some of them not with us at all. I mean, with, uh, with each other or by themselves. So that's uh, a summary of Ayuka's activities in astronomy and astrophysics. And uh, this is just to tell you, um, uh, give you a glimpse of the opportunities uh, in um, learning astronomy and doing astronomy uh, with the help of Ayuka. And of course, we'll be very um, happy to talk to you um, offline um, uh, by email um, if you want any more uh, information about this um, uh, and um, uh, in, uh, do write to us. Okay, so then um, just uh, the beginning of, um, of, of this course, I just wanted to motivate you just to um, um, ask why are we studying astronomy astrophysics? What's the use? A lot of people, this is the first question they ask. If they, um, when I first meet somebody and say I, I teach astronomy, uh, the first uh, impression people have is I'm an astrologer. So they ask me whether I can tell their future. And, um, and so uh, about 50% of the people I meet on the street think I'm an astrologer. I want to very emphatically say that I do not believe in astrology and that is not what I am. Um, in fact, astronomy started from astrology. Uh, to some extent, because um, people wanted to know where the stars are in the sky at any given point or uh, where the planets are at any given point. And uh, from that motivation, a lot of the mathematics that we now use was, uh, was generated. And uh, not just mathematics, as you will see, uh, uh, most of uh, physics came out of questions that were asked about the sky. Astronomy is the oldest science. It is the science because um, when um, in the olden days, uh, when <laughs> you didn't have any television at home, you didn't have any, um, any um, uh, other forms of entertainment, after the sun went down, the only entertainment you had was to look at the sky. And there were so many things happening in the sky. There were so many stars, there were things moving in the sky, um, uh, you know, comets, planets, um, and slowly moving. And then, um, uh, then you had to navigate uh, by using the stars in the sky. You wanted to go to the nearest village. You you know you you knew which direction by the direction of the sun and the moon and the stars, and, and so you had to know how to read the the sky. You then had to memorize the positions of the stars in the sky because you had to know all this in order to navigate on sea or on land. Also, you needed to know um, what time of the year it is because. Uh, because you wanted, you had to, uh, for example, sow your seeds for agriculture or do your harvest. And uh, you had to know um, when certain seasons will change. Um, our religious festivals are tied 
to the phases of the moon and also the time of the year, which is given by which constellation is in which part of the sky. And all that, you know, you didn't have a calendar hanging on your wall. So you, um, um, you had to know all this by looking at the stars in the sky. So astronomy is very, very important in people's lives. And everybody was fascinated by the sky. Everybody did the theory of the sky. Everybody knew um, or um, would try to understand why the sky was there and what the stars were. And of course, obviously, when you don't understand something very much, uh, you fear, you start fearing it. And so there's a lot of fearful stories about what will happen um, when uh, certain planets come in front of certain stars or whatever. And, and, and this is where uh, the, the astrology part of uh, this exercise diverged from astronomy because um, that, that's where mythology and fear and superstition took over. But uh, the science part of astronomy, which is to figure out when the next eclipse will happen, for example, or when do I expect a certain planet to be in a certain part of the sky? These things were very important questions and these were answered by real science and then mathematics and, and later physics. And slowly um, that went into what we now call astrophysics. So this is why we distinguish between astronomy and astrophysics. Astronomy is mostly asking questions about um, what the morphology of the sky is. I mean, what, what planets and what stars and what uh, it, it will be where in the sky. And, uh, and when uh, events like uh, eclipses will happen, and that depends on our knowing very in very detailed way where the earth and the moon and the sun, et cetera, will be at any part of the year. Astrophysics, on the other hand, is a very new subject and it's less than a century old, I would say, or maybe just about a century old. And, and that's because when uh, that, that is when one started putting physics together with, um, with astronomy to answer questions like what are the stars? What's inside the stars? Where did we come from? How old is the universe? Um, uh, what, what is the universe? How large is the universe? And surprisingly, a lot of these answers came only in the last 50 or 100 years. And I hope uh, as we unfold this set of lectures uh, over the next month, we will answer some of these questions and show you how we began to understand the, um, the nature of the universe. And that's, that's why I say astronomy is the oldest science. And I wanted to spend the next few minutes trying to motivate astronomy as well, because a lot of people, when they realize I'm not an astrologer and I can't tell their future, ask the question, so why are you wasting your time studying the, studying the sky? What is out there? And what will we gain from you knowing what a star is? What if we didn't know the stars? What, what, what would happen? And my, question, my answer to that is, is that it motivates a lot of other things that we use in real life, right? A lot of the science as we know it came from astronomy questions and still come from astronomy questions because in the olden days, that was the only source apart from nature here on earth that threw up scientific questions. And it still continues to do that. And in particular, astronomy and astrophysics is a place where we see the limits of our science and we understand the limits of our science, the highest energies, the highest masses, the, the tiniest uh, uh, you know, um, um, length scales and the biggest length scales the of energy as, as well, everything um, and, and time and speed, uh, all that, the extremes we see out there in among celestial objects and 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 thus we can look at where our the science that we deal with where the limits are where it fails where it needs further amendment and things like that so for example here's a good example of uh, how uh, uh, um, astronomy and astro astro astronomical questions motivated science as we know it this is um, uh, a page from Galileo's uh, book of, of, of his diary. And this is the first time when he's using a telescope on the sky. And before that, the belief in uh, the general scientific environment was that 
things change only on earth. Nothing in the, the heavens, the, the sky is something that is divine. And so nothing can change, it is perfect. So we think, we thought that, for example, the sun moves around the earth. All the planets move around the earth. All the stars move around the earth, right? And, um, and, and all of them, the stars and the planets and the sky, they're perfect. All imperfections are here on the earth and everything moves around us. Galileo took the telescope and pointed it at Jupiter. And if you look at um, this, this particular uh, entry in his diary, you can see that he's looking at the four moons of Jupiter that he could see with his small telescope that he's just acquired from some from uh, sailors who had built and invented the telescope. This is the first time a telescope is used not by a sailor, but um, by looking at the sky. And what Galileo understands is that night after night, he sees the positions of the moons around Jupiter change. And he's noting every day where the moons of Jupiter are. And then he realizes that these little stars that you see around Jupiter, he doesn't know their moons. He sees them as stars around Jupiter. They're going around Jupiter. And then he realizes that they are to Jupiter as the moon is to us. And this is the first time something is discovered in the universe that, uh, that it has other things moving around it. Because we, we thought the whole of, uh, whole of the universe moves around us but now we found something. So this is where um, our whole view of the universe changes. And we realize that uh, this is the beginning. Of course, Galileo makes other discoveries like he discovers that the surface of the moon is exactly the, like the surface of the earth. So the moon is similar to the earth uh, and, and things like that. And, and, and so this is the beginning of our figuring out that the sky, the heavens, the celestial objects are just like our own world, right? So this changes our worldview, and this is why um, uh, this is this is why I put this up. Uh, you would also know that if you look at his diary, Galileo up to this point was writing in his native tongue Italian. Once he realizes that this is such an important discovery, from this page onwards, he starts writing in Latin because he thinks that is the proper language to write this up in. It's like if we started writing our science in Sanskrit. So this is very important. This shows you how our, our entire history of ideas changes by an astronomical discovery. The next important discovery, uh, which led to um, the beginning of physics as we know it, is from this book called The Prin Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, uh, shortly known as, as Principia by Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton wrote this book. Only he started writing this book because a man, a young student called Edmund Halley, um, actually, then by then, a young faculty at Oxford came to him, and he was a professor at Cambridge, Isaac Newton, came to him and asked the question, why does this comet keep coming back every 75 years? And, um, and, and so he started writing down the answers to that question. Remember, this is an astronomical question, very simple astronomical question that nobody knew the answer to. And he started writing down basic physics laws, which we call laws of physics now. He invented in this particular book what we learn as Newton's laws of physics that we learn in school. Uh, he wrote down the principle of gravitation, uh, G M M over R squared is the force, and that is in this book that he needed. He needed that and then his laws of physics to then show that um, if, if uh, in the two body problem, uh, a planet going around, uh, a star or things going around stars will move in elliptical orbits. And we already, Kepler had already written down that law and he showed the mathematical basis of it. And then he showed that these comets will be also on elliptical orbits like the planets, but on a very high, highly eccentric elliptical orbit, right? So all that we know about mechanics and the basic laws of physics now comes from this book. And it came from some basic astronomical questions. Why um, does the moon go around the earth? Why does the comet keep coming back, right? So very, very important. If you think astronomy is useless, all of science comes from it. Then um, here is another astronomical um, observation. 
that shows that in the 20th century, um, this is the expedition after uh, of Eddington um, um, to figure out um, whether light bends around the, the sun. Uh, there were questions about why Mercury's orbit was uh, had an anomalous uh, uh, orbit around the sun. It uh, doesn't go in the same orbit. It actually goes around in a rosette and uh, it precesses. And also, um, uh, and so to answer that, Einstein formulated a the new theory of gravity, which we call the general theory of relativity. And that predicted that light will bend around stars as they pass stars. And in order to show that, Eddington had this particular um, uh, uh, expedition in which he observed uh, during a solar eclipse, the positions of stars around the sun. So this is another fantastic uh, experiment in which uh, uh, we showed the connection between physics and the sky. And I think finally, uh, we have to make this observation that astronomy is the basic place where um, we figure out where we are in the universe and, uh, and how small we are, how immaterial we are, in the universe. And that, uh, apart from science in general, it, it gives us a lesson, it gives us a perspective of, um, of, of where we are in the universe. And, and this is very, very, very important to put human beings in their place in the universe. And, and, and this is why we need uh, astronomy, astrophysics in our life more than anything else. Uh, in the very utilitarian point of view, you can see that a lot of things that we use in our, our daily life, in fact, almost everything that's there in your phone. Um, a lot of you will be actually observing this on uh, this, these lectures on your phone using Zoom, whatever you have there, your camera, your GPS system. Um, a lot of this came from astronomy. Uh, the first digital camera was built uh, so that uh, uh, astronomy, uh, we can put a telescope up in space and send pictures back, um, uh, GPS systems and basic radio communication that we used for phones now came from um, the very, very principles, the basic principles of radio astronomy. Uh, if you go to a hospital and do a tomography scan, an astronomer essentially um, developed all that method, uh, the entire method of, of, uh, of tomography uh, to study astronomical objects. So uh, a lot of this came from uh, um, the techniques of astronomy and continues to be, continue to push the boundaries of, uh, of science and technology. And, and a lot of that filters through into our daily lives. And, and this is why, um, even though you don't think that there's a connection between your phone and taking pictures of the sky, um, you see that, um, that, that these things come into your life. And this is why um, astronomy, astrophysics is a very important subject. And uh, uh, worldwide, it is now a, a core um, subject in university curricula and in India slowly, uh, we are, uh, doing that, we are bringing it in into university curriculum. Stay with us. Um, in this particular course, all through the next month, what you will see is that we are going to um, look at, look out um, into, into the universe and look at various parts of the universe. Um, and um, we will uh, use a basic set of units and a basic set of tools. And my job is in the next couple of lectures to set this up for you so that you, you understand because each subject has its own set of units, its own set of jargon, uh, and it, its own set of scale. Astronomy has a problem that um, it, uh, is, uh, its, its scale is very different from the scales we encounter in daily life. Yeah, uh, when we uh, walk, um, we walk meters or tens of meters, hundreds of meters, kilometers. But if you walk a few kilometers in space, you will get nowhere, right? So the size, and, and once we start talking about 10 to the power 19, 10 to the power 16, things like that, it kind of, the comprehension uh, is inadequate. And so uh, one needs to understand uh, basic units in order to understand the, the scale of the universe. And so what I will do is trying to try to establish the scale of the universe in the next uh, a few slides. Here is a picture of all um, the stars that there are uh, near the sun um, within um, about um, um, the, the, the nearest three parsecs or about 10 light years or so, um, about 12 light years. And you can see that spaces are very, it, it's very empty. There isn't much there in between the stars. There are planets around these stars, 
But in general, if you look at the space between the stars and compare them to the sizes of the stars themselves, they're very small here, even though those sizes are exaggerated, right? So the general um, unit that we use in astronomy, I'll motivate that is a parsec. And a parsec is roughly the distance between stars. The nearest star to us, as you can see, is about a parsec away. And, um, and, and so, um, uh, and a parsec is, is 3.2 light years. Okay, so uh, 3.2 light years, 3.25 light years is, uh, and I, I will motivate this later on why we use it as a unit, but that's kind of our unit of length. And then we talk about kiloparsecs, megaparsecs, gigaparsecs, and things like that. Okay, so this is one of the basic units that we will use. Now, I wanted to, to show this as a, uh, a cartoon to show, um, to give you a feel for what these parsecs, et cetera, mean. So for example, and this I use normally in a lecture theater, um, and that is why this is here, but of course it doesn't make sense in a Zoom lecture. But, uh, but the idea is that in a typical classroom, the distances we, we deal with are about 10 meters or so. And in 10 meters, light travels um, 30 nanoseconds, right? It travels three nanoseconds, um, in three nanoseconds, it travels a meter, right? A nanosecond, of course, is 10 to the power minus nine seconds. So this is why we don't see a delay in real life of something happening and the light reaching us, right? So for example, um, if I'm looking at a classroom and somebody gets, uh, gets up and leaves, I see it instantly. It's not that I see it um, because I see it actually maybe 30 nanoseconds later, and the response time of my nervous system is, um, is, is much, much uh, more than that, right? But um, in, in uh, the, the actual solar system, you see that it takes eight minutes for light to come from the sun to us. And so um, if, for example, the sun goes off right now, I would not know for about eight minutes, right? Because the information will not come to me for another eight minutes. And, and, uh, and so I will continue to see sun. And you already see in the solar system, you can see the importance of distances and the, and the, and, and the limit to the speed of light. You can already see the, dis, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the basic issue there. And then, um, as, you, as I said, the, the nearest star to the sun is uh, about a parsec away, a few light years. I've just written, uh, approximately one light year, but it's actually about four light years or so. And, um, and so already you can see that if, for example, the nearest star ceases to exist, we will not know for another few light years, for, for another few years. And so, because it's a few light years away. And so already information going from one part of the universe to another, just, just in between the, the two nearest stars takes a while. And so the finiteness of the speed of light becomes important. And, and that is why we need, um, we need this, uh, this, this, uh, 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 this, this kind of scale of the universe. I'd, I ask you not to raise your hand right now. We will ask you to raise your hand and ask questions right at the end after I finished, uh, but please type in your questions if you want. Now, if you go, and this, uh, this is one light year on one parsec, right? But it rapidly becomes very important, this, this, this time scale and this length scale, as we go out to the nearest galaxy. So for example, if you, um, if you go to the nearest um, galaxy, um, um, and the, the size of the galaxy, uh, for example, um, is, is, uh, uh, is about uh, the nearest galaxy to us, uh, outside our galaxy is about say 50 kiloparsecs away, 50 kiloparsecs, is, uh, is 150,000 light years. So it means that when the light, um, th if I see a galaxy, the light that left that galaxy um, um, is 150,000 years ago, which means the light left that galaxy as I see it now, when humans were not yet humans. And that's why there's this caveman type picture. Uh, you know, the humans as we know it are less than 100,000 years uh, old. And so um, already just looking at the nearest galaxy in the universe, you are going into time scales which are older than the human lifetime, the lifetime of humans, not a single human, but humans as a race. 
And so, um, so already you can see the size of the universe being so much bigger than the time scales we play with in here on Earth. And uh, finally, we are looking at this, this particular cartoon that shows in, in the universe, the galaxies live in clusters and, uh, and these are the basic units of mass in the universe. Our nearest cluster is the Virgo cluster, which is about uh, 2019 megaparsecs away. And, and this means that's about 65 million light years away. So when I look at the Virgo cluster, I see those galaxies in the light that left those galaxies. And this is just the nearest cluster of galaxies. It's like the nearest city to our village. Uh, the light left that particular cluster of galaxies at the time the dinosaurs were becoming extinct 65 million years ago. That tells you the relation between the, the size of the universe and the space between the, even the nearest galaxies and the, the time scale that we have here on Earth. Remember, the Earth and the solar system are four and a half billion years old. That's about a third of the age of the universe. So we are a very young star and a young solar planetary system, much, much younger than most other stars that we see in the sky, right? So when we um, look at the night sky um, through a telescope, we, what we do is um, <clears throat> normally, or, or even with the naked eye, we see uh, what uh, the picture that we see on the right hand up there where my cursor is, right? And, and we see stars. We see stars and, uh, and, and uh, the stars are red, red and blue. They have uh, different magnitudes, different, uh, uh, different brightnesses, different, um, uh, different colors, right? And we look through a telescope and we see the same stars, okay? But if you actually take <clears throat> a very small part of that sky, say that little rectangle, and then take a very deep picture not with our eyes or with a small telescope, but with the Hubble Space Telescope up there in, in orbit, which has exquisite resolution and is a reasonably big telescope. What you see is a picture like this. And this is the deepest, one of the deepest pictures taken in the first um, half of Hubble Space Telescope's life uh, called the Hubble Deep Field. Now, the difference between this particular picture and this particular picture is that all the specks of light that you see there are stars. And um, in this, the other picture, in that small blank part of the sky, the deep picture taken by the telescope, shows you what are known as galaxies. There are only two stars in that picture. There is, you look at that cross, that one, and that one. These two are the only stars. Now, what's the difference between stars and galaxies? A galaxy is made up of billions of stars. They are systems of their own. We only know this in the last 100 years. We didn't know this. For example, Einstein didn't know this when he was writing down his, his theory of relativity in 1915. He did not know the difference between stars and galaxies. It's a very new subject, right? So these galaxies, so we live in a galaxy that's full of stars and we look through that screen of stars. So all the stars that we see here are in our own galaxy. And the two stars we see in this picture are also in our own galaxy. They are in the foreground and we are looking at the rest of the universe as if through a window. And that window shows us these island systems like our own outside. And we are looking at through the screen of stars. And this is what humankind has for tens of thousands of years looked at the sky and wondered, what are these specks of light? And some people thought the sky was some kind of a cloth and there, there's some heavenly light outside and there were some holes and the light was shining through all kinds of things. And, and now we know that those stars are like the sun, but they're very far away. And then we also know that these are galaxies that are very far away. And, and just to, and the rest of uh, today, we don't have much time. I'm just going to motivate this uh, a little further, the, this, the difference between stars and galaxies. And we'll come back to um, the rest of the issues tomorrow. If you look at this now, you will now know that, I mean, so the, I'll go into a little bit of history to, to show you how we came to know this. And it all comes from um, a, a wonderful uh, bunch of people, um, starting with William Herschel. Now, William Herschel was very, became very famous because he discovered a planet uh, called Uranus. But he was actually not an astronomer, an amateur astronomer. 
He was a musician. He was an organist in Bath Cathedral, a German who was brought in because uh, he was the music director of the cathedral, of, of, of the church. And then he, he uh, composed music and he played the organ. But in his spare time in the evening, in his uh, house, he built telescopes. And he, he built the largest telescopes in the world in his back garden. And his, uh, his uh, uh, sister, Caroline Herschel, lived with him and she was a singer. And she was very annoyed that her brother was building all these telescopes all over the place, but slowly got very interested in, in, in what he was doing. If you look at these telescopes, the 20 foot telescope and the 40 foot telescope, it, that refers to the length of the telescope, not the size of the mirror or lens. Um, these were things that um, um, Herschel built. Uh, these were the biggest telescopes in the world at that time. And through that, he started looking at the rest of the sky and he realized that in the sky, some things were point objects and something, some things were very fuzzy objects. And these he called nebulae uh, using um, the, uh, the Latin word uh, for fuzzy objects, essentially clouds, clouds. So these are celestial clouds. Now, Caroline Herschel also got interested in, in her brother's um, telescope. And she also, after her brother fell asleep, she could stay up much later at night. And, and she started looking at the sky and she in her lifetime discovered eight comets. Uh, William did not discover any comets. And so Caroline's life is very, very much worth, um, uh, worth reading about. Um, after William Herschel, um, his son, John Herschel, um, built much bigger telescopes and took them to the Southern hemisphere, to South Africa, to look at the Southern sky, which is different from the Northern sky, which we will look at. So this family played a very important role. And one of the first things as I said they did was to, to differentiate between the stellar point objects and the fuzzy cloud-like objects, which are, and they're asking the question, are they the same? And these fuzzy objects were also um, noted by another man. And here is the other man's picture on the right. And his name is Charles Messier. And Messier is a, is a name that a lot of amateur astronomers know about. They use the Messier catalog. Charles Messier in Paris was asked by um, the king of France to uh, make a list of fuzzy objects in the sky because it was already known that there are fuzzy objects in the sky because comets were very important. Comets are also fuzzy in the sky, but they come and go. And it was felt that comets are very, very important. Um, and the king of um, France had a competition uh, asking people to discover comets because we needed to know, because comets apparently astrologically uh, were very important. They give us information about you know, the future and things like that. That's what, that was the belief that, at that time. And, uh, and so they want, uh, he wanted people to discover comets, but people were looking through these telescopes and finding the same fuzzy objects in the sky, which turned out to be actually nebulous objects in the sky. They're not comets. So Messier made a list of such things, which can be confused with comets. These are the nebulous objects, which Herschel, unknown to him, because uh, of course there was no Twitter or internet at that time. So he did not know about Herschel doing the same work in England across the channel. He made a list of things that are not comets, but are fuzzy. So these fuzzy objects in the sky, um, which are nebulae, um, they are these two independent lists, the Messier list and the NGC catalog, which comes from National, the, the, the general catalog, uh, which comes from William Herschel. And, and, and later, only in the 1930s, did we understand what these fuzzy objects were. And I've given you uh, four examples here, and this will be the last thing that I do today. I'll give you four examples of here from, that are there both in the uh, NGC catalog of Herschel and the Messier catalog of Charles Messier. And here is one of them, and that is the first of the, uh, of the Messier catalog M1, and it turns out it's the Crab Nebula. And here is M3, M51, and M27. And just to see how different these things are, and people thought they were basically the same, they're fuzzy stars in the sky. This one, M1, is actually, as, a, as we know now, the remnant of a stellar explosion, a stellar death that happened a thousand years ago. And this is what remains a thousand years later. And it's a single star, but exploded remains. That's called the Crab Nebula. It looks the same on the sky through a small telescope that, that these people were using. As, as you can see, I put the size of that object there in arc minutes. Um, uh, a globular cluster 
which I know, we know now, M3 is a globular cluster that has a million stars, right? This is a single star, this is a million stars. And M27 on the right is a planetary nebula, something that is that forms from a star after its general life is over. And we will learn about the planetary nebula phase when we look at stellar evolution later on. And what happens is the star loses a lot of its mass from its outer layers and it becomes a nebulous object. And there's a star, the rest of the star is right at the middle there. You can't see it in this particular case. In many cases, you can see it, right? Single star, single star, a million stars. And this is what we now call a galaxy M51 is a nearby spiral galaxy, very much like our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which has more than a billion stars. Million stars, billion stars, single star, single star to an astronomer um, in, the, uh, in the 18th century looked exactly the same. And they were asking the question, how, what is the difference between these things? And the crucial thing to answer that was that we had to know the distance to these objects. We had to know what these objects are. And uh, we had, uh, in, in order to do that, we had to know the distance. So you would find, and I will dwell on this in the next few lectures, we will find that measuring distances in astronomy is the crucial. Unless you know the distance to something, you don't know how big it is. The sun and the moon on the sky are exactly the same size. That is why one can cover the other in eclipses. But they are not, in essence, the same thing because one is 800 times further than the other and actually it is 800 times bigger. And that is why uh, we, um, uh, once we know that, we realize what the sun is and what the moon is. Similarly, the difference between these clusters and nebulae and, and things like that 200 years ago was a mystery to astronomers. And now because we have measured distances to these things, we know exactly how big these things are. And now we know that then the universe is made up of things like these, the galaxies. And these are the basic building blocks of the universe, like molecules are the basic building blocks of matter. So these are units. It's not that matter is not exchanged between, uh, between galaxies. Uh, we call these galaxies um, and, uh, and, and a name that came from the 1930s by, from Harlow Shapley. And we know that there are two kinds of galaxies in the universe, about three quarters of all galaxies in the universe are these flat spiral structure galaxies and many of them are nice and round galaxies. And, uh, and so, and we live in one of these things. And, and this is what our, this is my last slide today. Um, um, Asim, can I just end here and ask questions or do, would you like me to go on? Do you have questions there? We have a few questions. So. Okay, so I, I will just, uh, I, I will, this will be my last slide today and I'll start from here again tomorrow. The last slide shows us where we live in the universe. This is our home galaxy, the Milky Way. And as I said, this, you can take a picture of a galaxy like this, M51 from our own galaxy because we are outside it and we can take a picture. Actually, in this particular picture, you see two galaxies, M51 and M52, which is a tiny galaxy here and they're interacting with each other. There are many galaxies that our galaxy is interacting with, but we can't take a picture of our own galaxy. So these are not photographs because we live inside it, right? So these are artists' impressions of a very painstaking 3D map that we have made of our galaxy of the stars and features in our galaxy by measuring distances from where we are and, and very accurately and trying to make a 3D map. And this is what we know of our galaxy. We know that our galaxy is a flat object, very much like uh, a chapati. And, uh, and uh, this is a side view of our galaxy. And here's the galactic center. And we are around a sun, a star, it's a very small star, uh, which is about 25,000 light years or eight kiloparsecs away from the center. Of the, so nowhere special. We are on the fringes of a galaxy, nowhere, not in the middle of this, 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 as you see, it's like a chapati because it bulges in the middle. There's a bulge with most of the stars in the middle, lots of globular clusters around, and we are on the outer parts of the galaxy. This is why we know that when we look out at the sky, in some directions, we um, see stars that are right here in the middle, in the disk of the galaxy. We, we see a screen through the screen. Now, if we look in this direction, and we'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow, in this direction, we see a, a, a band in the sky, right? Because we see all this stuff, and that band is called the Milky Way. And, and this is what people saw in a clear sky. You can still see it if you're away from the city lights, a band of 
and, and, and that is called the Milky Way. And if you look at this, this is the top view of uh, our galaxy. You can see a lot of these uh, spiral arms. There are five of them that we know about now, and we are very near uh, what is known as the Orion arm and uh, um, at 25,000 um, light years from the center of the galaxy. So this kind of uh, tells you where we are in the universe. I will start from here. Uh, tomorrow and talk about uh, uh, you know what we see, how we see the sky from where we are on the on the Earth near the Sun, and what astronomers' basic tools are in in in, in trying to understand the, the the sky. And we'll establish um, how we measure these distances out to different things and try to understand the three dimensional picture of the universe. Okay, so I will stop here. And uh, and uh, and go into um, uh, looking at well, who, what questions have been asked, and uh, um, I, I will let Asim um, manage this uh, this session, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'm very happy to answer um, questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so what I would request now is that uh, some of you have asked questions in the chat to me. Uh, if you asked a question, please raise your hand using the button on the bottom right. You can see somebody has already raised their hands. It looks like a little blue hand. So please raise your hands and I will selectively unmute you one by one. Okay, so first we have a question from uh, Shrikala D. So I'm going to unmute you. Please, uh, you will also need to unmute yourself. Yes, and ask your question. Hello, sir. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Uh, so my question is, how do we experimentally measure these distances between the galaxies? And my sec I have a second question also. You have so shown the pictures of the different galaxies, right? So are these actually taken just by using the telescopes or is there any other way of taking the pictures of these galaxies? Okay. These are my two questions, sir. Thank you. Uh, very good. So um, actually, um, you have preempted a lot of the lectures in this course. So I'd ask you to just be patient and listen to these lectures and attend these lectures. Um, I will spend uh, several hours talking about how to measure distances between objects, right? So I will come to these later on. And um, um, we will also talk about the techniques of astronomy of uh, using telescopes and using cameras with telescopes. So uh, some of the pictures that you saw, but this picture that is up on the screen right now is, a, um, uh, is, a, uh, is an artist's impression. It is not a real picture. But when I've shown you the pictures, these are pictures taken with cameras that are attached to telescopes, right? And that's the only way you can take a picture of the sky. We will, throughout the course, talk about various techniques of taking pictures of the sky, not just through uh, optical telescopes that mimic the response of our eye, but we can take pictures through radio telescopes, through X-ray telescopes, through gamma ray telescopes, to infrared telescopes, and all that kind of thing. So, um, um, so there are various ways of understanding and imaging objects in the sky. And that's, that's essentially the basis of astronomy and astrophysics. And this is what we're going to discuss later on. But yes, so um, uh, you can't really take um, a picture of anything up in the sky uh, with your naked eye. And uh, our um, eye has a very limited response that it can integrate only up to one tenth of a second. So we cannot collect enough photons to build pictures of, um, of, 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 of uh, celestial objects. So you need cameras and detectors of various kinds. We need advanced imaging techniques and, and we need telescopes. So all that uh, will be done later on. Next question, please, Asim. Yes, so we have uh, Yashodhan Joshi. So I've unmuted you. Hello, sir. Yashodhan, yes. I wanted to ask that uh, in the image of Hubble deep field you showed, you said that there were only two stars which were identified by the cross. So why the stars had the cross and the galaxies were like blobs or something? That's a very, a very interesting question. And that's actually a very um, um, a detailed uh, point. Uh, it so happens that because the stars are point objects, they're actually much smaller than, than we see there. Uh, the stars have a huge amount of light concentrated in a very small point uh, because the angular size of the stars is very small. Whereas galaxies are fuzzy objects. They are big objects with light distributed all over them. And so in the way the imaging happens, uh, um, the, the telescope is on a support system 
and that support system and the mirror itself cause a diffraction pattern. If you understand what diffraction is uh, in physical optics, and that's because light uh, is a wave. It doesn't go in straight lines, actually. It, it, it goes around corners and it can form diffraction patterns. So if you have a very intense point source of light um, in this particular setting, and this is the details of the optics here, it creates a certain pattern uh, due, uh, which is due to the shape of the mirror and the support the mirror lies on, or in, in the Hubble Space Telescope, the support of the, the mirror system. And as a result, the point objects, uh, which are very bright, not all stars, but the, the, the brightest stars have a, what is known as a diffraction spike. And these are uh, basically uh, due to the optics of the telescope. Uh, this doesn't come from um, the, uh, the galaxies because the galaxies are, are not point objects. Um, they are uh, extended sources. And, and so um, the diffraction spike part of it is, gets washed out. So as I said, it's a very detailed and boring answer, but, uh, but it also helps us uh, distinguish between stars and galaxies in many images. This doesn't happen only in space telescopes. It happens in terrestrial telescopes as well. Uh, a lot of the sky survey photographs that, you, that, that, that are very popular that you can see will have uh, bright stars come up with diffraction spikes. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Next question. Okay, so we have uh, Unique Sen Gupta. I've unmuted you. Hello, sir. Good morning. Uh, so basically, I have a question that uh, the we observe both supernova remnant and planetary nebula and stellar nebula. So, uh, what, what, what is the major difference between these two? Like, what is the major difference between a planetary nebula and a supernova remnant? Uh, again, you are preempting uh, the questions uh, that will be raised in this course. That you know, you could have uh, essentially um, said, "What is in lecture 13 and what is in lecture 27?" And the answer will be the answers to your question. So. You will, when once there will be, uh, you, you go through the, um, um, the uh, courses that are being given in this whole uh, month on stellar evolution. Uh, they will talk about what uh, supernova remnants are, what planetary nebulae are, what main sequence stars are, all that stuff. So I'm not going to try and answer this today. Thank you. Uh, so Shomak, uh, do you want to also look at the YouTube question, uh, if there are any? then I need to uh, actually stop sharing my screen, if that's all right. That's fine. Um, so share and uh, uh, just a minute, let me, uh, no, uh, I need to go I also out. take a question from uh, here. I need to go out of, uh, um, Sorry, I can't seem to go out of uh, without sharing. Yes, okay. yeah. right. Right, so here, um, do you want me to take questions? Uh, take one from here. I have one here, and then you could uh, switch over. I, uh, have, uh, am I still sharing screen? No. No, good. Right, so, so let, me take some, let me take a question from the YouTube. Uh, um, um, YouTube uh, things and 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 see. Um, so uh, there's a question there, um, which uh, um, I uh, people are are putting in questions there, with, I, and I don't have the names. I'm sorry, of the people who have asked it, but um, let me take the question, and and it says that uh, if light takes a finite amount of time to travel, and remember I I, I illustrated that by that cartoon. Then when we say the universe is expanding, the, essentially the universe is expanding in the past. How can we say that it's continuing to expand? It's a very, very good question. And here is, uh, what, what, here is how we would address it. See, in astronomy, we have a very natural time machine. If we want to go to the past, we just look very far away. As I said, the nearest cluster of galaxies are as we, uh, we are seeing it as it was 65 million years ago. In fact, we have no clue whether that galaxy is there now, because that light takes that information. No information can travel faster than the speed of light. Um, and, and so that information from us will reach us, whether that gal what galaxy is there now, 65 million years in the future when I won't be here, right? So 
um, naturally, we have this time machine that we can go back in the past by looking further and further away. But of course, it's not a time machine. I can't come back. I mean, I can't, I can't say anything about the time evolution at that distance, right? I can't wait long enough. So all I have to do is to go in the past by going further and further away. And so when I want to know that the universe, uh, whether the universe, uh, uh, what the state of the expansion of the universe, I have to look further away. And I can see that in the past, if I can measure the expansion of the universe, um, uh, and this is known as the Hubble constant, we'll talk about this uh, later on, um, we see the past values of the Hubble constant or the past values of the expansion rate of the universe when we look further and further away. And this is exactly how we now know that the universe is actually accelerating by measuring the speed of expansion of the universe further and further away, right? So you can see that we can talk about the, not just the expansion of the universe, but the speed, the rate of expansion of the universe, the change in the rate of expansion of the universe. We had expected, even if you look, if you look at Stephen Hawking's book, Brief History of Time, you will see how he talks about how the universe is going to expand and slow down. And we now know that's not happening. It's actually it's accelerating. And this is um, the whole issue of dark energy that you will learn about later on. And yeah, you're absolutely right. And this is the way. So we, as we go uh, further and further away, we look in the past of the universe. We look at the past characteristics of the universe. But we look at the universe near us as well, very near us. And we look at uh, what's happening now. And by now, uh, you know, the, the, the lag between the nearest galaxies and us are millions of years, light years. Millions of years are nothing compared to the, uh, the 14 billion years or 13.8 billion years. That's the age of the universe. So, um, so by when I mean now, I mean the last million years. And when I mean in the past, I mean the last few billion years, right? 10 to the power six and 10 to the power nine. I know these numbers are big. These numbers are hard to comprehend, but a million is one thousandth of a billion, right? So it's really very small time compared to a very large amount of time. When you're talking of the age of the universe, we are talking of 10 to the power nine years, okay? So we know the current uh, expansion of the universe. We know the past expansion of the universe. And we can build up the history of how the universe expands by looking at galaxies further and further away. Okay, so let me go back to uh, the Zoom questions. Asim, do you have a last few questions for me? Um, you yes, want to stop now? Take uh, one last question uh, yes. from Amitesh Singh. Uh, yes. Amitesh. Um, hello. Good morning, Hi. sir. Good morning. Yeah, sir. I just wanted to ask you, like the picture is showed of our galaxy, right? The Milky Way. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to ask you, uh, what's about that central bulge in the galaxy? Right. So that's, uh, the, that's just the shape of the galaxy. The galaxy has many components. The galaxy's disk is very flat. Okay, that's the thing you saw when you saw the other picture, which on, on the face on view. But the edge on view showed that in addition to the disk, there are many other components. That what you didn't see there, and when we come to uh, discussing the structure of the galaxy in later lectures, we talk about there is actually a thicker disk right in the middle, and then there's a spherical bulge. All galaxies have this structure. Uh, galaxies have a spherical bulge of stars right in the middle, and and this uh, kind of mimics the uh, the structure of the underlying matter in a galaxy, which we will we will talk about later on. And this is the dark matter halo of the galaxy in which this these stars are sitting. So all galaxies have this bulge. Elliptical galaxies are actually the bulge. They don't have the disk component. They're much larger bulges. In spiral galaxies like ours, which is about 75 to 80% of all galaxies, the bulge part, the ellipsoidal part, is right in the middle. And that surrounds the, and that's the older part of the galaxy that, is, that, that, is the, uh, that has some of the oldest stars. You see these globular clusters that are clus the clusters of stars that are also uh, distributed in a spherical way around it, around the center. And we, our solar system, happens to lie in the disk of the galaxy outside this bulge. Okay, So there's a very diff big difference between the bulge and the disk. The disk is where the young stars are, star formation is happening, old stars are in the bulge. And when we come to the lectures on galaxies, and in particular our galaxy, 
we'll talk in much more detail about this. Okay. Thank you very much for everybody for attending uh, today. Um, please stay on. We have a little break. And then after this, um, uh, we have the next lecture, the second lecture today given by Professor Deepankar Bhattacharya. Okay. Thank you. And bye for now. Thank you so much.